So hello everyone. Uh, we continue a, a series of ecclesiological lectures on ecclesiology um, uh, run by uh, San Ignatius College at Stockholm School of Theology. Uh, today we have as our speaker uh, my colleague uh, Adriana Barra, whom I'd like to introduce to you in case you don't know her, but I assume most of you know um, Adriana. Adriana recently uh, joined our faculty <clears throat> and we are very happy to have her with us. Uh, she certainly uh, enhanced uh, the uh, ecclesiological, so to say, team in our school. It seems that ecclesiology is a strong, uh, is a strong kind of side of our school and Adriana certainly has enhanced it. Um, Adriana uh, originally uh, comes from Romania where she uh, started, started her studies in civil engineering actually and then uh, she decided to move to, uh, to theology and she um, did her a bachelor degree in theology in, in Sibiu um, a wonderful place, a great school, a great theological school. Um, she also, uh, she did her uh, PhD at the um, University of Montreal in Canada, where she had moved with her family by then. And uh, um, she taught uh, theology at Concordia University in Montreal in, in Canada. Uh, since 2013, uh, she has been an executive director of, of the Canadian Center for Ecumenism. Uh, so she was a prominent figure in the North American ecumenical movement. And uh, um, um, uh, developed a dialogue, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue in such, in a bit of difficult region of Quebec, which is quite secular. And uh, Adriana managed, nevertheless, to uh, deal with uh, with the challenges of secular secularity in that particular region of uh, of Canada. Um, um, also, it should be mentioned that um, Adriana spent uh, um, a year as an international fellow fellow at um, uh, the Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue in Vienna, in Austria. Um, she has been prominent in, uh, in theology, in ecumenical movement, uh, in ecclesiology particularly, and uh, uh, we were happy to receive her uh, last year, actually, to our faculty at San Ignatius. Um, so for her, it is a sort of public debut uh, to speak publicly. Uh, so Adriana, the floor is yours and we are all heirs. Thank you very much, Father Cyril. Uh, yes, it's my first public lecture and I'm happy that it's online because you cannot see how I tremble. So thank you very much, Father Cyril, for uh, introducing me. Uh, my lecture uh, today has as a starting point the book Ministry in the Church, a historical and pastoral approach by uh, Paul Bernier. Uh, the book focuses on the role of the ordained ministry, ministry uh, but tangentially also analyzes uh, the ministry as a facet of uh, all baptized, not only the vocation of the few. Uh, I begin my presentation by emphasizing that one cannot understand ministry without understanding first the church. Although the, book, uh, the book's title suggests that it's about the church, the author presents a Catholic perspective on ministry, uh, on the history, but um, more than, than history on ministry, um, uh, on the pastoral side of the ministry. One could ask uh, if the Catholic church is the church, because this is what the title suggests, or what do we understand by the church? Some scholars speak about the church in Nicene, uh, Constantinopolitan credo terms and define it as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
Yet if one is a member of a Catholic church, learns that he's the member of the true church. The same if it is a member of the Orthodox church, he learns that his church uh, keeps the apostolic uh, and the Holy Father's unaltered teaching. Uh, finally, if one is a member of a Protestant church, he learns that his community witnesses uh, the unspoiled church that Christ established. Um, and so every um, member of a Christian community believes that he belongs to the true church, otherwise he would not be member of that specific church. We also learn uh, that the church is the body of Christ, but which church? Because we can't ignore that there are families of churches, non-Calcedonians, uh, non-Calcedonian, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, Protestants, Protestant that are not in Eucharistic communion and that among them are irreconcilable differences, at least from a human perspective. My answer to this dilemma, uh, because many students ask me, uh, which is uh, the true church? Which is the first church, the initial church, the, the church that keeps uh, the healthy tradition? Uh, and my answer to this dilemma is in line with scholars who explain that every branch of theology and ecclesiology is one of the most complex area of theology, has a side that we know that has been revealed to us called the cataphatic side and another side, the apophatic side, that is a mystery. We don't know all about it just like we don't know the essence of God. Uh, we don't know everything about the church. What I want to emphasize here is that we have knowledge about the church, but our knowledge has boundaries. And certainly the Holy Spirit can surpass these boundaries. He blows when and where he wishes. Thus we should be at ease of using the word the church when we speak about different Christian denominations. Um, and um, uh, we also know that uh, um, the church is one mystical body of Christ. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, there are specific denominations or families of churches or simple churches in which Christian life is fulfilled in its plenitude. So we, we should be at ease to speak about the church, uh, whatever church we are speaking uh, about. Paul Bernier's book, uh, The Ministry in the Church, uh, doesn't present the church ministry as the one mystical body of Christ, uh, but gives a Catholic perspective on ministry over the centuries. The book is divided in, uh, in 10 parts and the first four chapters present the ministry uh, from the apostolic time until the year 500. From chapter five, the non-Calcedonian students, scholars or churches uh, don't necessarily find pertinent uh, information, especially on the history of their church because starting with chapter five, the book follows the ministry in the Chalcedonian uh, churches. The Eastern Orthodox uh, students, scholars, churches can learn about the history um, and challenges that ministry uh, in, encounter um, from the first chapter until chapter five, which cover um, the apostolic time until the East-West split in 1054. After uh, chapter five, the book presents the history and pastoral ministry, ministry of the Western church. And finally, the Protestant churches can learn uh, what ministry was before the reformation, precisely until uh, chapter seven. Uh, because from chapter seven until the end, the book uh, presents and focuses exclusively on the ministry uh, of uh, the modern Catholic Church. However, uh, the book finishes with contemporary uh, questions and challenges, challenging problems in ministry that all churches face. 
this invite uh, profound reflections. Uh, I choose to present my reflections by using as a case study, the churches in Canada. On the one hand, uh, because I know them best, uh, I work with almost all uh, churches in Canada. I don't say all because there are always uh, evangelical churches or Protestant churches that are not necessary in dialogue with other churches, but I work with uh, the most important uh, denominations or churches in Canada. And uh, on the other hand, because uh, churches in majority, if not all Western countries, face similar challenges. Uh, the first relates to the priesthood today. The author, um, uh, Paul Bernier, questions why people leave the church and young men are not interested in priesthood like they were centuries before. Um, in Canada, for the last decades, many Catholic priests left the church to marry. Uh, is celibacy requirement for, for priesthood a problem? Uh, it could be, although it shouldn't, because the candidates uh, know that becoming a priest in the Catholic Church implies a celibate life. The Catholic Church in Canada is forced to, uh, to import priests from other countries like India and South America, simply because Canadians have virtually zero interest in priesthood. The crisis of having candidates to the priesthood is not only a Catholic problem, it is a problem of many, if not all, Christian communities in Canada. Uh, in 2017, the United Church of Canada, the largest Protestant church in the country, was on the point to dissolve the entire church because they didn't have candidates for ministers, not only because they uh, have, uh, didn't have ministers, uh, candidates for ministers, but also because their churches were empty. The attendance of the church was practically zero. Um, the Anglican community in Canada, besides the diminishing number in church attendance, confronts another challenging uh, challenge, the ordination of women. In 2015, when Mary Irvin Gibson was elected Bishop of Montreal's Anglican Diocese, the Anglican community was divided in two, those who accepted woman ordination and those against it. Uh, this uh, division is unhealed until today, uh, although six years uh, have passed since Bishop Mary leaves the church. Uh, let's take another example, uh, the Armenian Apostolic Church. Uh, it has uh, two heads, so to speak, because as uh, we all know, there are two Catholicos, uh, one on the Sea of Echmiadzin in Armenia and one in Antelia, Lebanon, uh, the Sea of uh, Cilicia. Each sea uh, has its diocese in Canada. The Armenian Diocese of Canada represents Echmiadzin Sea, and uh, the prelacy of Canada uh, represents Cilician Sea. The relationship between the two are cold, uh, I would say even frozen. Uh, and uh, last year they had jurisdictional fights uh, among them. It was said to, to witness their internal struggles and incapacity to find ways of reconciliation, especially because the Armenian, the Armenian Apostolic Church is what, one of the most wounded churches within, Christian, uh, within Christian history. I refer here to the genocide of the Armenian people on, and church. And this in, uh, internal frictions uh, wound the church even more. Finally, the Orthodox churches has also, uh, have also problems. The second and third generation of immigrants don't speak their mother language anymore. Uh, some choose to attend the liturgy, uh, liturgies in the Orthodox Church of America, OCA, which has English and French uh, parishes uh, around Canada. And uh, I don't enter here into the political and ecclesiastical disputes 
uh, but Ocas autocephaly is only partially recognized. However, uh, there is a Eucharistic communion between the Oka and the wider Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, many Orthodox, uh, especially young, uh, leave the church because they don't identify uh, with its traditional approach, not in the liturgical and sacramental life, which they like, they love, but in answering contemporary social questions. Uh, they reproach the church's silence in the issues that Christians face today. And they also reproach the church that it doesn't find, way, it, uh, it doesn't find uh, ways of keeping up with uh, modern society. Consequently, uh, bishops have difficulties in finding candidates for the priesthood. Uh, usually priests are imported from the mother countries. The problem, however, is that the majority of these priests don't integrate in the Canadian way of life. First of all, priests don't receive salary from the government and they have to do other jobs besides their priestly obligation to earn their living. They don't have money to buy or build churches and the renting spaces for churches come with challenges and I can give you some examples, limited time for liturgies, other spaces rented in proximity where, for instance, uh, are rehearsals uh, for a concert at the same time with the liturgy, uh, place and displays the iconostasis before and after the liturgy, etc. There are, there are many, uh, many challenges that they face when they rent spaces. Orthodox believers in Canada don't revere priests, as this is the case in their mother countries, uh, which priests uh, and clergy in general don't appreciate very much. For these reasons and others, priests often decide to return to their mother um, countries. There is another problem that the uh, Orthodox uh, churches in Canada face the mother churches don't always understand the needs of their churches in diaspora because they live in two different worlds, so to speak. Often this entails the formation of churches severed uh, from the mother churches. Beside the many problems and challenging, um, challenges um, clergy face, Lately, leaving the church is the most painful problem in Canada, at least. A survey made uh, by the Catholics in 2018 uh, reflects this reality that applies to all the churches uh, in Canada and probably in many other countries. I present here only the main reasons why people leave the church according to survey. First, Christians are, treat, uh, are treated poorly by church leaders, officials, and priests. Many women said that they feel undervaluated by the church. Many people found their pastors arrogant, distant, and insensitive. Others complained that parish personnel uh, are often very unhelpful un, uh, and indifferent to, to people's uh, needs. Uh, the parish personnel are uh, in the front line, uh, so they should be kind and compassionate, says the survey, uh, and uh, simple kindness, uh, kindness, simple compassion can help or even save a person who is in a crisis. Uh, but unfortunately, often this uh, um, don't happen. Another uh, reason uh, that the survey shows is that uh, that people mention uh, is bad preaching. People found sermons very often boring, irrelevant, and poorly prepared. Preaching every Sunday might not be an easy task, uh, but clergy should be learned in preaching because this is one of the main problems that make people leave the church. For a good sermon, a minister has to be trained in public speaking, uh, to know very well the scriptures, and learn to interpret them. But above all, the priest 
has to know how to make the pericope of the day actual. Uh, he has to interpret it culturally and to be sensitive to the needs and interests of the parishioners. In other words, the homily should be a moment when the question coming up from the depth of the human heart meets the great answer proposed by the Bible. Um, the last, uh, the last um, thing that I, I want to mention here is uh, from the survey is that um, the people, what the uh, people said that uh, I love the church, I left the church uh, and the parish uh, and the parish and nobody called me or wrote to me because the priest or bishops don't care about parishioners. Uh, people need to see that clergy care about them. Uh, many go to church without knowing much about theology, ecclesiology, church divisions, etc. They go to church because they know that there is something about love and caring, and they need love and care. No wonder they feel hurt that nobody calls if they decide to live in a moment of crisis. Um, paradoxically, uh, the survey is encouraging because it can inspire the clergy to adapt their ministry. Uh, there are concrete, simple and practical things that they can do to improve the church uh, situation. The second uh, major issue uh, that the book invites reflection is the role of women uh, in the church. In the Canadian Protestant churches, women's role is prioritized. For instance, in the United Church of Canada, women can occupy any function in the church as a man, from reverend, uh, moderator, general secretary, uh, to um, a member, to being a member of the general council. Uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, the role of woman is valorized. As far as, uh, back as 1971, a group of Catholic uh, women in Ottawa met with um, the Canadian Bishops' Conference and asked the bishops for five things. To declare clearly and unambiguously that women are full and equal members of the church with the same rights, privileges, and responsibilities as men to make strong and immediate representation to the forthcoming synod of bishops, uh, asking that all discriminatory barriers in church law be removed, to the ordained qualified woman um, to the minist uh, for ministry, uh, to encourage by whatever means deemed appropriate the presence of a qualified woman on all bodies dealing with matters that concern all church members. And finally, to take all practical measures to ensure that the attitude of the clergy towards woman, sexuality and marriage respect and inherent, uh, inherent uh, dignity of woman. Uh, with the single exception of the auxiliary bishop uh, of the Ukrainian eparchy, who thought woman's place was uh, in home or at home, uh, all the bishops uh, accepted um, uh, this recommendation and were willing to raise this question in their 1971 synod. Uh, Catholic women received partially what they asked, uh, but nothing concerning uh, the ordination. However, uh, after the Catholic uh, Bishops' Conference in 1971, women play an important role in the Catholic Church's life. Uh, there are many examples, uh, but I give here only two that I, I consider that are uh, important, uh, especially from an Orthodox perspective. We don't have some, uh, something like that. Uh, women have a proeminent role in theological education at all levels, uh, from Sunday schools, uh, elementary schools, colleges, uh, um, to uh, universities. There are more professors, women, the Catholic universities in, in Canada, 
or departments than, than men. And second, a uh, woman can distribute uh, the communion not only in the church during the mass, but also to the sick in hospitals and all persons in home, in homes who can't go to the church. This woman, I, I call them Eucharist bearer or hostia bearers, uh, have special reptical, uh, receptacles for communion and are ready to go uh, whenever is needed. Finally, in the Orthodox churches, a uh, woman's role might seem inexistent, at least for somebody out from the church. In reality, uh, women have important roles in the Orthodox church. Uh, I wish to examine uh, here uh, and to present here uh, the most discussed subject about women, the ordination. While in the Protestant churches, women's ordination is a reality and in the Catholic church, a preoccupation, women uh, in the Orthodox church, church don't debate much on this subject. Um, there are mainly two groups one who believes that woman priests in other churches is a symbol or, or an example of their equality to men, uh, of woman uh, empowerment and liberation from men's imposed rulership. On the other hand, uh, there is another group who have a very different view. They don't aspire to the priesthood because they love the church as uh, its life uh, and its life at it is. We all know them by heart, um, uh, the so-called traditional explanations. Uh, and I uh, enumerate some of them here. Um, by tradition, all priests are men. Uh, Jesus Christ chose uh, the apostles and all were men. Christ is uh, the priest by excellence, the priests are men. Women have their gifts, many, uh, men have their, theirs, and they complement each other. Uh, women have as an example of living the mother of God who was a humble and discreet presence in the life of Christ. Being a mother is a gift uh, for, a, for a woman, being priest is a gift for men, etc. There, there are many, many explanations that we know all of, all of us, we know them by heart. Yet these are only these are not uh, the only reasons. Women acknowledge that priesthood in the Orthodox Church is reserved for men precisely to protect them. Uh, in their understanding, if one wants to destroy a church, they hunt and kill its leaders. Uh, we have the example of the Armenian Apostolic Church during the genocide, in one day, almost all priests of the entire church were killed. In the Middle East, to be Christian in general and the priest in particular can be a daily challenge. The same in the ex-communist country, priests were the first to be imprisoned, tortured and killed because one of the points uh, in the communist agenda was to destroy the church. Women are somehow protected uh, and not in the front line, so to speak, although uh, their security uh, faces different uh, challenges during the uh, persecution times. Today one can say, uh, okay, uh, communism is not a threat anymore in Eastern Europe or uh, the Western diaspora. It is time then for, for the Orthodox woman to be ordained. Although priest's life uh, might look uh, like an easy life in these countries, priests and especially monk priests say that it is not. They said that they live like in an arena uh, where is a life and death fight for the priest and for the soul of each believer that the priest has in his care. Uh, for a contemporary world, uh, these are superstitions, uh, fables, uh, or stories uh, for children. But in the Orthodox Church, beside the Bible, there is another root for faith, 
the tradition with capital T. In this tradition, a proeminent role occupies the life of saints, where instances uh, of life and death uh, battles are clearly described. Many Orthodox women understand that priests are in the front line in the seen and unseen battles, and they don't aspire, aspire to such a place. They see themselves protected against the trial that priests might face. However, um, behind or besides any monk, uh, deacon, priest, uh, bishop, patriarch, and all the saints of the church, there is always a mother, a grandmother, or a grand-grandmother of unwavering faith. Uh, certainly, they have um, an essential impact on the education of the future clergy of the church. It is in their power to grow up their son, future clergy members, by whispering in their ears that women have to be better valorized and encouraged to use their gifts for the benefit of the church. Um, another um, issue that the book touches, uh, contemporary issues, is uh, ecumenism. Um, ecumenism should be a subject of, uh, of an entire lecture, if not of a semester. Uh, I, I want to mention here only that ecumenical relations should be instances and opportunities of, um, to manifest Christian love. Uh, if I return to my case study, Canada, uh, in Canada, ecumenical, um, uh, ecumenical friendship uh, is practiced. Like in a sincere uh, friendship relation, churches don't criticize each other. They accept their brothers and sisters as they are and uh, eventually learn from each other how to live, uh, survive and ministry in today's world. The last topic that the book invites, um, there are many topics, but uh, I would say the most important topic uh, and the last in the book <clears throat> that invites reflection um, is what ministry should be in today's world. Um, <clears throat> to continue with Canada's case study and to include the media, which is part of our academic uh, life more and more, I invited the leaders of the largest Christian churches in Montreal to answer very short, in a few minutes, the question, what ministry should be in today's world? So to have the answer to the most important question in the book, to have the answer from different churches, from different perspectives. Let me share my screen. Uh, and I invite you to listen to this very short video I, I made with, with the church representatives. And then uh, we return for my final thoughts. Thank you for your passion. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Rosemary Lambie, for accepting uh, to have a, um, a little talk about uh, what is the ministry uh, in the United Church in today's world. Uh, I know that you are the head of the United Church of Canada for Eastern Ontario and Quebec. And my first question is, uh, what should be the ministry in the United Church in today's world? I think our ministry is what it has always been, which is to share our faith, to share the love of God, to share the examples of Jesus Christ in the world and in the community in which we live. And that has been challenged in the last year, for sure, with COVID. And, and uh, it's also been uh, a process over the years as, uh, as people have been getting away from church, is how to keep ministry alive. So congregations have to be prepared to change and evolve a little bit with, the, with current times. They need to be mindful of who are the people around them. So it's not just for the people inside their building or the people that are comfortable coming once a week to be with them. The real ministry that happens is how do we reach out into the communities? How do we meet the needs of 
the poor and the children and the widow and the orphans and the prisoners and the hungry and uh, the homeless. And a lot of the United Church's work is based on social justice and being mindful of who the communities are around us and how we can share from our abundance. We don't always recognize our abundance. So sometimes we have to look and see what do we have and what can we share? And that's very much the way Jesus was teaching is use what you have to try to make life better for the neighbors. And uh, so whether our church is a building or whether it's out of a community center or a school or some of our buildings are being sold now with COVID, they said we haven't been in them for a year. So we don't need the building, but we still need to be doing the ministry. We, we're having worship services on Zoom. We need to find ways to keep on doing community meals and providing clothing and doing the fundraising. Those are the challenges now is how you do that. But it's because the money that they raise doing those things goes to help the community around them. And they're very concerned about who people are, not because they come to church, but because there are neighbors in the biblical sense of being a neighbor. Thank you very much. Uh... Rosemary, um, wonderful, because I know that um, the United Church has some, some challenging, uh, challenges uh, during the last two years at least, uh, but I can see that is a rebirth of, of the United Church in Canada, I would say. Yeah. Bishop Mary, how nice to have you with me today. Uh, it's, yes? It's a pleasure to be with you, Adriana. Yes. Um, I, um, I want to mention, before I ask you my questions, I have two questions for you, but before I mention, before I ask you the questions, I want to mention that you are the first bishop woman in Quebec. Uh, so um, uh, I, I want to ask you what should be, uh, or what is it, uh, the ministry of the Anglican Church into today's world? Well, I think the ministry of the church is first and foremost to make Christians and to train those Christians to grow up, to discern uh, God's call to them, uh, how they are to serve Christ in the world. And that will take all kinds of different shapes and forms. Some of it is uh, within the church and some of it is out there in the world, uh, discerning where Christ is and where we can serve Christ in um, all kinds of ways. The church has often gotten involved in ministry where ne the needs of society were not being met. And so that's one of the areas that I think is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And my second question is, um, do you think that uh, ecumenism helps the church? Is it necessary? Is Anglican church involved in ecumenism? Uh, the Anglican Church of Canada, I think the Anglican Church throughout the world is, is committed to being in dialogue and in respectful relationship with Christians of other denominations. It's absolutely important that we not pretend that we're the only people who get it right, but that we understand that we all stand with a particular view to um, our relationship with Christ, and we may differ in how we speak about it and how we view it, but uh, we are all united under Jesus Christ. And he is the one who calls us into his body. And as such, I don't believe that we have the right to say, you're not in his body, or that person's not in his body. That is, um, we may not always like what other denominations do or stand for or how they approach things. Uh, they may not like how we do it. But I believe that he is the one who unites us and calls us to serve him uh, in the church and in the world. How wonderful. Thank you very much, Bishop Mary. Was, was that good enough? <laughs> um, Reverend uh, Dr. George Leligian, thank you very much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Dr. Barra. I just want to ask you a question. How the Armenian Apostolic Church keep ministry, keeps ministry alive today? Uh, according to our tradition, uh, after the Pentecost experience, the apostles Thaddeus and Bartholomew came to evangelize Armenia. And so our ministry has been going on since the first century and continues through to the 21st century. 
The ministry of the Armenian Church, I would say, is based squarely on the proclamation of the gospel, uh, the gospel of repentance and of healing, the gospel of baptism and of the remission of sins, the gospel of judgment and the hope of the resurrection, and the gospel of salvation. This is the base of our ministry and is timeless, if you will. Uh, if I may be permitted to paraphrase from Acts chapter 1, this ministry commences in the geographic area known as the Republic of Armenia. And from there, it spreads to the diaspora or the dispersion of Armenians around the globe. It then goes to those people who have married into the Armenian community. And then finally, based on the Great Commission at the act, end of, of Matthew, is to take this gospel and preach it to all nationalities around the world who wish to hear the living word of God. So the ministry at this point is based on a, an ancient apostolic system of church where we have bishops and priests and deacons. We have a system of monasteries and cathedrals and parish churches. We have a daily cycle of prayers. We have regular celebration of the Eucharist. And we have daily readings all included within the lectionary. Furthermore, the ministry extends out in forms of outreach, which are prayers for those who are uh, ailing, those who are in need of special assistance, those who are looking for further education, such as Bible study or Sunday schools. So our ministry continues on in this fashion. We are a ancient church. And therefore, many of the rituals that we have are still conducted within the ancient Armenian language. But in the 21st century, we are increasingly moving towards using the local language in the countries in which we are ministering, largely because the people no longer speak the Armenian language as well as they once did. And certainly the liturgical language of the church is akin to Byzantine Greek or old church Slavonic, or even Latin, which is to say only a few academics still actually understand that language. So we do have this active use of uh, modern language in terms of our preaching skills and our teaching skills. Right now we have five active seminaries around the world, and we're actually hoping to start a sixth in North America soon. Uh, the majority of our clergy continue to come from traditional Armenian households, very pious uh, and very attuned to liturgy and to a regular cycle of feasting and fasting, as we say. And so these students are trained not only in the chanting of psalms and the learning of hymns, but also in the idea of theology and Christology pneumatology and ecclesiology within the Armenian church itself. These are taught uh, at a university level throughout the seminaries and uh, are, we have different seminary levels uh, equivalent to high school or secondary school, uh, to undergraduate and to graduate levels. Many of our uh, clergy are very fortunate that they're able to attend uh, excellent universities outside uh, and further their education as far as theology is concerned. Though we are always very careful to make sure that what they are doing is learning and appreciating more of their own Armenian theology uh, and that they're able to preach that within their particular communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your Grace Ioan Kassian, thank you very much for being with me today. Uh, you are um, the Bishop of the Romanian Orthodox Church in Canada. Uh, and I kindly ask you to answer uh, one question. Uh, what should be the ministry of the Orthodox Church in today's world? Yes, uh, thank you for, for the question. It's a, a wonderful question. Yes, it's a preoccupation today because uh, uh, as we see, uh, the churches are oriented today for the mission. It's a different maybe society than as we knew probably not more than 30 years ago because I was raised in Romania in the, during the communist period and I know very well this period and uh, 
I studied this uh, period and now since uh, more than half uh, of my life I spent outside the country in Europe or in North America and I see that uh, the church has made a great effort to um, to keep the faith and to to keep their flock uh, inside the churches what does it mean is that uh, we understand that we are not anymore in a traditional society as we uh, saw before as i said probably more than 30 40 50 60 years ago it's a big transformation and uh, new means and uh, modern means and uh, the electronic uh, means uh, made us make a lot of progress knowing a lot of things but still if we think to the churches the churches are very um, tied to the idea or to the reality of living in the community in transformative community and uh, for the orthodox churches we i don't think that we we can go too far from what we saw for example in the in the apostolic time or in the uh, life of uh, the church in the past yes we have to see in which way we can um, be relevant for the society of today but the the two i i, I would say two main uh, tools that the church has uh, to do uh, her job i would say like this is the word the word of god the word the preaching and the second one the, the celebration the, of the sacrament the divine liturgy or the, anyway the service is the religious service the first one it's uh, one that we saw uh, at christ he come here uh, to preach and to announce the reality the unseen reality of the kingdom of god and uh, giving the first, uh, giving the revelation and the elements of the kingdom of God in our hope. And these elements, or the, the same way, um, happen with the uh, holy apostle, with were the disciples of, of Jesus. And I think that in, in the church, discipleship, it's, uh, it's very important because we follow in... Um, in our example of life, the life of Christ and the life of the saints, the example of the life which for us represent, represent the, the Christian life. The second one, which is, let's say, more practical and, and a kind of um, um, uh, having a contact and, and concrete way of the consequence of our word is the celebration, the religious services or the sacraments which uh, it's a, are the results of our prayer to God. And in this way, in the celebration, we enter in direct contact with the grace of God and we feel the reality of what we talk in the words. And I think this is, this is anyway, two, two realities that we have, the churches need to do in the society of today, to talk about, because we don't know, we will not know anymore about the, the kingdom of God if we don't um, uh, preach or say the words of Christ. And at the same time, in order to, 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 be, uh, to feel that uh, this is a reality, we have to celebrate. Because, because in the celebration, in the celebration of the sacrament, of divine liturgies, for the most of the orthodox churches are the most important is a central sacrament of the church reuniting the people in the mystery of the kingdom of god in this way in the community individually and uh, in common we feel this mystery of the kingdom of god and this uh, make us um, stronger make us uh, feel uh, the peace which is not the peace of this world and and i think that this is uh, two elements at least two elements that we have to keep in mind as the church. Uh, most reverend christian lepin uh, thank you very much for being with me today uh, you are the archbishop of the catholic church of montreal uh, and i kindly ask you to answer a question a key question for christianity today 
Um, what is the ministry or what should be the ministry of the Catholic Church into today's world? Well, we, we are called to bring uh, God's love into the world. So how do we do that? Do we do that? It's, uh, it's always a, a challenge, I guess, for us to be instruments of God's love. So uh, challenges today, uh, certainly in, the, in this time of uh, COVID and pandemic, uh, is about uh, solitude and isolation. I think uh, how to face, uh, how to reach out to people who feel isolated or were isolated or uh, have an experience of solitude. I would say also the family, because uh, the, the family for me is like the, the forgotten sheep, you know, of our time, the lost sheep of our time. Uh, we have worked out uh, important steps for uh, and rights for the, the, the dignity of the human person, but uh, the rights of the family, uh, I, I don't think we're there yet. We... Uh, we know how to talk to talk about the individual, but I think we learn we learn to we need to learn to talk about the family, and, uh, and the, of course you can you can say there are many kinds of family, but there is one kind of family which is the union of a man and woman and a woman open to life, and uh, and this kind of family needs care. Everybody needs care, but also this, the the family needs care. Uh, any any family in the sense of people being together needs care, but we need, uh, so the, the individual uh, needs care, but also the family needs care. And it's the, and it's to discover the love of God, whoever we are, we need the, the care of God and the mercy of God. Thank you very much. How wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to, uh, to present what I think ministry should be in the church today. Uh, church leaders, in my opinion, should follow the example of Christ. He didn't come to serve, but uh, to, to be served, but to serve. Uh, and this has to be uh, uh, their ministry, to serve. Uh, they should be living examples of humbleness, uh, mercy, faith, and love. Uh, they have to, uh, to make known that the sacraments, liturgy, uh, and prayer are ve uh, vehicles to sainthood. Um, saints uh, uh, are numberless and so different that, uh, for, um, that each, uh, and so different from each other uh, that anybody uh, can find an example to, to follow. Uh, any clergy should make them known uh, especially to, to the young generation. Uh, in other words, uh, the church's ministry should, uh, should be to make saints, to help people not miss the opportunity of became, becoming saints. Uh, can any church make saints? Uh, one might uh, say, well, Protestants don't believe in saints. I would argue that they do, but they have a, a sense of guilt is so deep that they believe it is only the grace of God who can save them. The potentiality of sainthood exists in any church. Uh, if we look only uh, to contemporary saints, uh, one can see uh, them in any uh, Christian church. And I, I want to mention only one and then I finished uh, in each church. Uh, Corey, uh, Ten Boom was a Protestant Dutch. Dutch. Uh, she forgave her and her sister uh, Nazi torturer, and she said that she never felt the love of God so vividly and intensely inside her as she felt uh, as she felt it when she forgave her torturer. It was Christ living in me, she said. Who has the gift of such divine forgiveness except a saint, for a saint? Uh, saint Maximilian Kolbe, Franciscan monk, Catholic, uh, volunteered to die in a place of a stranger in the Auschwitz death camp. Who can be a confessor of such Christian love except for a saint? Armenians killed during the genocide because for the simple reason that they were Christians. The Copts in Egypt uh, killed by Isis 
Uh, maybe you remember in 2015, they even recorded uh, the atrocity. The saints of prisons in the ex-communist Orthodox countries, they all and others uh, like them not mentioned here because they are numberless like stars in the sky, uh, died with the name of Christ on their lips. Uh, in my opinion, sainthood surpasses the boundaries of confessional differences and saints are the members of the church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, uh, for, uh, for your presentation. And uh, again, the interviews were wonderful and uh, it, it, they are really worth it to listen, them, listen to them again. I hope they will be avail available in, in recording. Also, thank you for your reflections and your, uh, your thoughts. Um, I think you concluded it in, in a very nice way by, by, by connecting the phenomenon of the church with uh, sainthood. Uh, after all, that is indeed the purpose of the church to produce saints. Uh, very nice set, and uh, I think uh, this summary somehow reflects also the kind of line of San Ignatius. Um, now it's time for Q&A. Uh, we still have half an hour for uh, that activity. So I suggest, um, I suggest that you type in your questions to the chat. Or if someone wants to ask a question in person, you can raise your hand and I will give you a floor. So who wants to be asking first? I don't see any hand as of now. Well, uh, while people are thinking want to ask, uh, what to ask, Adriana, may I ask you myself a question? And this maybe uh, uh, will incite some other others to, uh, to put up their own questions. So you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, idea of uh, Una Sancta when uh, Christian groups identify themselves with, uh, with the one church and the way how they use the church uh, in the wake of this uh, self-identification. Um, you probably know, and many of us know, that this question has been discussed in the Panorthos Council in 2016. Uh, so what is your take on the discussions in, in, at the Panorthos Council? Some people say that even though the Panorthos Council intended to be very much ecumenical, to proclaim, you know, uh, uh, the openness of the church. At the same time, the language it eventually used was not so much ecumenical. What do you think about this? Um, well, I think, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, that uh, we don't know everything about the church. And uh, uh, even in the uh, ecumenical councils or uh, meetings or um, some churches claim that they are the, <laughs> the one uh, apostolic uh, uh, church uh, exclusively. Uh, I think that we don't know everything about the church. Uh, we, sometimes we have this tendency to put boundaries, boundaries uh, uh, around what we think that is, uh, is the one apostolic uh, and Catholic church. Uh, in my opinion, um, the church is the body of Christ made by, um, and um, uh, in the body of Christ, there are many members and we don't know them uh, because it's not to us to know everything about the church as it's not for us to know uh, the essence of God. So we have uh, knowledges about the church, but uh, uh, we don't know uh, everything about it. Now, why I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my presentation, what is the church? And uh, maybe Father C uh, Cyril, uh, uh, you are an expert on ecclesiology. Maybe you can give uh, a more complex and uh, more uh, um, exact uh, answer to the, this question. But uh, students and many students, not they ask me, what is the nature of the church and what is the real church, which one is it? Because we want to be member of, members of that church. 
uh, and um, uh, they they learn in their churches um, that their church is the right church, and sometimes they are uh, confused about it. And I can give you an example from Canada if we stay with Canada. Uh, a few years ago at the Canadian Center for Ecumenism, where I, I have been director for the last seven years, uh, there, come, they, uh, um, there was a, um, a group of uh, a number of journalists that came from, from France uh, to do uh, a documentary on ecumenism and uh, uh, on the life of the church in Quebec, because as you know, between French, uh, France, uh, France and, and uh, Quebec is a tied uh, uh, connection. And they went in different churches. Uh, and uh, many churches in, in Canada are in dialogue. So they are involved in this ecumenical dialogue. But we, we, they, they went in a Russian church. I, I love the Russian church, but they, it's just the experience that they have. And they, when they, they went there, uh, the priest said, okay, you want ecumenism? Come to our church. And this is, that is the end of the discussion. So um, what, what uh, can I say is, is that um, many believes that their church is the right church and they have uh, arguments for that. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have to, to understand that God, uh, God uh, can uh, blow his spirit uh, in other churches also. And I just uh, remember from the Bible, uh, you know, how Christ, uh, um, uh, when he spoke with a Samaritan woman was a scandal for the, the apostles because the, uh, the Samaritans were considered uh, not holy, not at all, and uh, people to be despised. But, but Christ went to speak with a Samaritan woman. Then he doesn't give an example of uh, a good behavior, uh, doesn't give an example of a priest of a or a, a, a Levi. Um, Levi, uh, but uh, he, he gave the example of a Samaritan, a good Samaritan, and also out of 10 lepros that were healed, uh, only the Samaritan returned to, to thanks uh, Christ. So we, this has to, to give us some, uh, some reflective thoughts, uh, what the church is and what means the one uh, apostolic and uh, uh, Catholic uh, church one body, mystical body of christ thank you now i'll give a floor to uh, the center of ecumenical studies of the catholic university of ukraine from beef please go ahead show up and go ahead uh Pablo. thank you Th thank you very much uh very interesting uh, uh talk uh, so thank you to father Cyril and uh, especially to adriana uh, I would have a question about uh, the particularities of the ecumenical openness in diaspora. Uh, do you have a feeling that diaspora communities are more open to uh, uh, the dialogue in general, where you cited some, I think, negative, yes, example of the Russian Orthodox Church, but probably there are other Russian Orthodox Churches, the communities will be more open. So do you see any... Uh, any positive uh, climate there, and is it po how and is it possible to somehow transplant this uh, positive experience into their countries of origins, uh, to the big churches? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, in diaspora, churches are more open to dialogue. This is for sure. We can see that. Uh, they are involved in, uh, in ecumenical um, discussions, uh, um, not only theological, because, you know, there are differences we, we have to accept. There are differences that are not yet reconcilable. Uh, we, we didn't arrive there. Uh, but uh, there are uh, dialogues, social dialogues, and they are involved in different social activities together. And I think uh, in diaspora, the churches cannot survive isolated. They have to be in contact with, with other churches. 
Uh, I give uh, the example of a parish, a uh, Russian parish, but the Russian church uh, in Canada also is involved in the uh, in uh, ecumenical uh, dialogue. Um, and um, not only the Russian Orthodox Church, also uh, the Ukrainian and uh, uh, Oka Orthodox Church of America, especially Orthodox Church of America. So uh, I think that is another reality in which churches uh, live when we speak about diaspora. When we go back to our mother countries, there are two instances, uh, could be countries where ecumenical dialogue is not accepted and, and there are always, there are within the church voices that are against um, the, the ecumenical dialogue. Um, but at the same time, during the communism, for instance, because I lived in, in Romania during the communist, uh, communist period, we could see um, a fraternity and uh, a love and unity between the churches that is unprecedented. I, I didn't see that even in the diaspora when we speak about ecumenical uh, relations. So uh, in these countries where we had these communists, torturer and um, um, uh, you know dictator, uh, dictatorship, um, uh, uh, we had a, a, a special relationships between Protestants, Catholics, and uh, and Orthodox uh, that it cannot be seen even in diaspora today. Now, shall we desire to have um, um, torturer <laughs> or, or over us to, to to appreciate our brothers and sisters? No, I don't think so. But I think we have to learn to, to love the others, not to be quick to judge them quick because they have their own tradition or their, their own history. And we have to understand others from their own perspective. And I also think that when we speak with, uh, with our brothers and sisters, uh, Christians, brothers and sisters, and we belong to another church that those with whom we speak, I think that in our discourse, they have to recognize themselves. So in our discourse, don't criticize. I, I can see with my, with my children, if I criticize then I, I don't obtain anything. But if I speak nicely with them, they, they try to find what is the problem with them. So I, I think it's the same thing uh, with the church when we speak uh, on behalf of one Christian denomination to other churches, uh, I think we have to have a, 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 um, a discourse of love, not a critical discourse, and to help the other to see himself or herself in our discourse. And I think uh, uh, we, can, we can earn uh, <laughs> or we can learn what uh, Christ's life or um, love or uh, Christian love is about. It's, it's a good exercise of Christian love to speak with other Christian denominations. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Another question comes from the chat. Uh, it's rather long. I, I will summarize it. Um, uh, so according to the Syriac tradition in the past, it was a custom that women were allowed to distribute communion at homes, to bring the communion from the church to homes. And uh, uh, the question is, uh, and this practice does not exist anymore, is not supported anymore. Uh, the question is, would you think that reinstating this possibility for women would be a right way of female ministry in the churches? Together with this, perhaps the reinstating of the ministry of diaconesis in our churches. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I, I, uh, I know that there are some movements of having deacons, uh, the diaconies in, in, the, uh, in the churches, in, in the Orthodox churches, uh, and especially in monasteries. Uh, well, I, I'm open to, to see what the church offers uh, to women and uh, how they approach uh, this, um, uh, this topic. Uh, now concerning the, um, the distribution of the Holy Communion, uh, I think it's, it's a, very delicate, uh, uh, a very delicate issue. 
Uh, I mentioned that because in, in Canada exists in the Catholic Church, I, I've been very surprised to, to see that they have these receptacles and they, they go uh, with the host. And I have to, to mention that um, there are churches that they don't give only the host, but they, um, they put uh, also the blood of Christ on, on, on the host, um, host uh, Austria. Uh, so they, they really have the, the Holy Communion in, in the two elements, not only one element that they bring to the sick or to the old person. So I, I've been very, um, uh, very um, surprised of that. Now, if it is possible in the other Orthodox churches, I would say that depends on the church, what the church decides. Uh, I don't know if, if in the Romanian church, because I, I can tell you why. In, in the Romanian church, there are many people who are very superstitious. And uh, sometimes the Holy Communion can, can come in the hands of not the right person and can use the Holy Communion for other, uh, you know, um, for other reasons, not, not necessary to, to go with it. Well, well, now, of course, women would be in charge of, of bringing the Holy Communion to, to sick and to old people, of course, they, they should be uh, choosed from, from the, the women that are immersed in the life of the church. But at the same time, I, I remember that uh, even the communion uh, in the fourth century, if I'm not mistaken, please uh, uh, forgive me if I, mis if I make a mistake, uh, they start to give um, the Holy Communion with a spoon, so to be sure that is is uh, consume the Holy Communion is not used for other means. So it's it's a very uh, it's a very um, um, sensitive issue. But I think there are so many other things that women can do in the church. It's not necessary about the um, I, I'm I'm not in favor of the ministry exactly for the reasons that I, I mentioned. Uh, I think uh, it's not an easy life for 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 the priest, so I would not like to be in the front line in these battles, uh, unseen and seen battles. Um, but I think there are many, um, in many ways, women can, women can be valorized in the church. And I give uh, examples. Uh, for instance, they could be women that were abused and they cannot confess necessary to the priest. And they come to the church like uh, the last, they is the last uh, the last door that they open for help so a woman that that can uh, you know has special training in the uh, psychology or i don't know she can be of ed for for such woman um, so the, there are many examples that uh, how women can serve the church uh, but of course, uh, in, in the Syrian church, if this uh, was um, uh, a custom to, to let women to, uh, to distribute the Holy Communion, why not include it? Why not uh, adopt it uh, again and make it a contemporary, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a contemporary uh, custom and could be an example for the other churches? Thank you. The next question has to do with, uh, again, with your experience of the Catholic Church in Quebec, which is, even though a very secular province, still uh, has uh, the Catholic Church as the majority church, right? So the yeah. question is, uh, do you envisage, is it possible to reform the Catholic Church and to abolish the celibacy of priests? Well, this is, uh, this is the Pope's problem <laughs> uh, and his uh, <laughs> cardinals. Uh, uh, this is an issue that um, that arised uh, and is discussed in the Catholic Church, um, and in the, um, the Catholic Church in Canada faced some some delicate problems. I think in the United Church uh, in the uh, United States of America also they have these abuses in the church, uh, and uh, actually now. Um, uh, they are um, they are in process of solving some some very um, very bad uh, things that happened in in their church. Now to say that the cel uh, celibacy is the problem, I don't think so. I think that in any 
church could exist. Of course, we know that in the Catholic church uh, exists more than in the other church, but in any other fields, we, we could have pro, um, persons that have this psycho psychi psychological problem. This, this is not a problem of, of the church necessarily, it's the problem of the person who is in the middle of such scandals or such, such problems. Now, um, the celibacy is a problem, however, for the Catholic Church, because they don't have priests, um, um, uh, men uh, interested in priesthood precisely because they cannot marry. And especially in Africa, I understood they, they really consider uh, to let um, um, married men to become priests in Africa because it's a, uh, it's a crisis of having priests. And in Africa, there are men, uh, married men, who want to be priests, and they cannot because uh, of this celibacy um, requirement. So, could be, could be, we we can we cannot uh, see that happening. Uh, Pope Francis also mentioned um, several times this issue. So, could be, uh, could be a possibility to reform the Catholic Church in this. Uh, um, concerning the celibacy of priests. Thank you, especially given that there are already precedents, and I always mention our Greek Catholic brothers who are mm -hmm. Catholics and have married priests. Exactly, exactly. It's, a good, it's a good example. They have it already uh, among them uh, within their church, so yeah. Thank you. The next question is more theoretical. It's about the uh, image of the church of the apostles. Uh, so the question is rather general. Can you see how the apostolic fathers have developed this kind of image of the church as the church of the apostles? Well, I know that uh, especially for the Orthodox, this is a very dear um, idea. And of course, uh, it is the idea of continuing uh, the tradition and um, the continuing the, the apostolic tradition. Uh, this is also present in the Catholic Church. Uh, they have uh, the same teaching uh, that they are descendants of uh, the apostolic and they keep the apostolic teaching. The same in the, uh, the non-Chalcedonian churches, the, the uh, Armenian church, for instance, I give the example of the Armenian church because one of my invitees was from the uh, Armenian church. Uh, but at the same time, um, once with the Reformation, um, what the Protestants wanted, they, they wanted to return. This was the main goal, to return to the original church, what was the church in its original and untamed, as they call it, uh, state. Um, so... Uh, I, I, I would say that, of course, uh, I, I am a member of an Orthodox Church, and as the other members of other churches, I believe that, that the Church, the Orthodox Church, keeps uh, uh, this beautiful tradition, apostolic tradition and descendants within, uh, within uh, its, uh, its boundaries. But... Um, I, I'm open to, to see and to, to hear others, how they experience uh, the life in Christ and the love of Christ. Um, it's, it's all that I, I have to say on this, <laughs> on this topic. Thank you, thank you. And I think the last question uh, comes from uh, Michael Helm. And uh, it's a good uh, conclusion, I believe, uh, for our discussion. Uh, would you say that the role of women uh, would be the most important one in the 21st century for orthodoxy. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I, I would not say the most important, but one of them, one of them. Uh, there are other issues, important issues that the church uh, has to, to deal with, uh, jurisdictional problems. Um, recognizing new uh, autocephaly uh, churches or not uh, and studying uh, that. 
So the, there are so many things and issues that uh, tear apart the church. Uh, also, there are so many wounds that already uh, are historical wounds and um, dogmatical and theological that uh, that separated churches. There are it's so much work to do uh, within the church. So there are many issues, uh, but I would say that uh, women uh, could be valorized uh, in the. Uh, 21st century uh, orthodoxy uh, because they have a lot to offer. Uh, but I would not consider the major problem of the church, but one of the problems or one of the issues of the church. Right. Thank you. It seems that it is a good uh, finale of our uh, lecture today. Uh, thank you again, Adriana, for your wonderful presentation and special thank you for the interviews, uh, which I, I look forward to, to watch again. Um, thank you for those who participated in the discussions, who watched, uh, who listened to us. Uh, I hope we will continue this series, right? And uh, so keep tuned up. <laughs>